But today I got some really good news for you. And that is this. In fact, I got great news. God loves you. Yeah. He loves us. And, we, and when you think about that, you know, God has gifts for us. And uh, God says that we are special to him. And the song this morning that we sang about seeing him on the throne, that really spoke to my heart. Because this week, I, that's where I came up with these thoughts here, this, this week in my devotions. And um, is I, I saw that in Psalm 139, it kind of brings it out with all the different parts of this. Uh, it doesn't actually say these things, but you understand these things. And so, but that's what the verses say, the verses are saying there. And, uh, and I'm so happy, but when you think about seeing him on the throne, and man alive, I got to thinking, I said, one day I actually will. Amen. I mean, I will not just be singing about it, I'll be seeing it. Amen. And that excited me, it really did. And uh, this morning we're going to conclude our series on overflow. I say that, then I'll find something else, but right now we're going to close this out. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1, these verses will be on the screen. And oh, by the way, if anybody's cold, there's a blanket, there's blankets and shawls or whatever you want to call them, throws over here in the back behind Brother Carl. And if you say, I don't want to sit like that, I won't, I'm not a Native American and all that, I understand. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you my coat and two of y'all can enjoy it. <laughs> all right? So... But y'all, you know, Chris, do you need this for you and your wife? Okay, I just want to make sure. Right? He looked like he was fixing to say something, but in fact, I think he did. He just didn't want to admit it. Good to see y'all today. First Timothy chapter six, verse one. It says, "Let as many servants as are under the yoke count <clears throat> their." their own masters, worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, now this is important, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting uh, about questions and strifes of words where, whereof uh, cometh envy, strife, railings, evil sur surmising, perverseness, Beauties of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Here it is. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. All right? Let's just stop here. Let's go on to the message. We won't use the other verses at this time. We'll get, we'll get back to them. But uh, as you know, we're closing out here on this series, but... Uh, we find that Jesus was telling his disciples that, that out of our hearts would flow the streams of living water. That's what the overflow idea came from. And so the question I have for us is I've asked several times, and that is, what is flowing from us? Do we have compassion? Do we have a desire to serve? Or do we want to be uh, arrogant, self-confident in our own being, so what are, what's flowing out of us? I want us to see two things today regarding what flows out of us. Right from the text of 1 Timothy. And I think we can see that today. So uh, we're going to look at today that is that we would, we, sh we would overflow with contentment. Now that's something very difficult to do, isn't it? To overflow with contentment. In other words, I'm satisfied with what God has given me. You know, you think about that. See, people would look at us and see content Christians is what he wants to do. That's what God is saying to us. So how do we find contentment? 
Where contentment is not, okay? Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise, we know that verse. And verse 4, the proud, the knowing nothing, those verses. And then verse 5, we get verse 5. It says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So here's in our text where contentment is not found. Paul is this, uh, excuse me, he describes people of those who are false, but claim to be followers of Christ. And there was a lot of that, and there is way more today. And they do, they do not listen or agree with the sound teachings of Christ in the scriptures. They make up their own. They have their own Bibles, and they, they write it the way they want to, it to fit. It to fit. And, uh, and they want to feel good about it. See, they are conceited, understanding nothing, crave controversy, quarrel over words, uh, leading to envy, dissension, slander, <clears throat> excuse me, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people. See, we should consider the frequency of Paul's concern about people who show this type of fruit. See, Paul has repeatedly warned about the, uh, these kinds of false disciples. But there are people who try to find their joy in causing grief, causing problems. Some people enjoy it, believe it or not. And I, I'm telling you, I don't understand that. I understand joking and having fun, but not to really provoke people to be to, 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 into meanness. I don't understand that. And uh, it seems that their attempts at pleasure... Uh, actually came from the stirring the pot and fanning the flames of strife. Contentment does not come from causing problems. Amen. It doesn't, it, and it can't. Using God is not the means to contentment either. See, notice Paul says in verse 5, supposing that gain is godliness. Supposing that gain is godliness. See, they think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Uh, using God for your own selfish purposes will not accomplish what we think it will accomplish. And so often we have what we think and what God says, and they're two different things. So often. See, God rejected them. Excuse me. When Israel tried to use God for their own gain and selfish purposes, God rejected them and they lost everything. Remember that one of the big questions for the book of Job was this. Will Job serve God for nothing? That's what was asked. Do you serve God for what you think you will get out of him in this life? Or do you serve God for who he is? It is a very, I think that is a strong question. Paul notes that uh, there are those who claim to be followers of Jesus, but they're using godliness as a way to cause problems, uh, seeking financial gain. So number two, where contentment is. So where is it found? Verse six, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now look at that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. See, devotion to God paired with contentment will be a great wealth into your life. And the first view toward contentment is, is uh, relative. And uh, you look at, a, look at all that you have now and compare it with what you started with. How did you come into this earth? You came into this earth nothing, naked and you had to be slapped on the behind to breathe. Mm -hmm. Most of you need to be hit in the head. But anyway, <laughs> I was probably, but no, just saying that. That's free. See, we start with nothing and we end with nothing. Think about that. When you go to your grave, basically, 
you go with nothing. You leave your bank accounts, you leave your cars, you leave your homes, you leave your jobs, you leave your friends. So basically, you're going into that casket alone with nothing but clothes on your back. And I think that was what God promised. One of the two things. So appreciate what you have and stop being focused on wealth and possessions to have contentment. See, material possessions are not the key to a good life. Godly contentment is the key to a good life. And uh, simply look at what we have. Contentment is, a, is about seeing what you have and not focusing on what you do not have. You ought to be thankful what you have that God has given to you and don't worry what you don't have. And hey, we've all been to that place. Man, I wish I had. I wish, man, I'd like to have. I want, why doesn't God give me like he does to uh, Lucy over here. Why doesn't God do that for me? You know, and you think about it, and we, we talk about, you know, things that we don't have when we need to be careful about that. Just simply look at what we have. See, discontentment immediately arises when we look at things that we don't have. And this is what advertising is all about. When you look at advertising on the television, on the boards, on the newspapers, or whatever, they are trying to show us what we do not have so that we will no longer be content and we'll go buy what they showed us. And that happens. New car. New home. New this, new that. Got to have every gadget in the, in the world. My garage is full of gadgets. As I say, Sydney wants the garage. She can have it. And she will not know what half of the stuff is. It's so old. But anyway, you think about that. And, <clears throat> you know, so look at what you have, what God has given to you, what he's allowed you to have, and appreciate it. See, God is letting us borrow these possessions. We do not start with them, and we do not end with them. He lets us borrow them. We have them for a space of time, from our birth to our death. And we're not all going to live eternally here on the earth. If you understand what I mean, we're all appointed unto man once to what? Die. Die. The second view is an absolute view of contentment. Notice what Paul says in verse 8. He says, And having food and raiment. Raiment is clothes. All right. So having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. See, Paul says that with the essentials of life, we should be content. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't have other things, that God doesn't want you to have other things, but he is saying, you need to learn, first of all, to be content with what he has given you. And then he will add things to it. And this is quite a perspective uh, change for us, especially for the prosperous point of view that we have in our culture today, that you got to have these things to be somebody. See, Paul wants us to think completely different about what we have. The word raiment might be a little too exact as the word is plural and it can be actually translated coverings. Coverings. So Paul might have in mind both clothing and shelter. And if you have food and coverings, you have enough. You have what you need. See, everything else is a want, not a need. And we often think of our needs as retirement plans, cars, phones, and all of this kind of stuff. But Paul is telling us that we can only have contentment when we change our definition of what we need. I think I need a Rolls Royce. I think I need a large three-wheel motorcycle. 
Can't ride a two no more, I know. I rode a bike and about scraped my car all up and hit the garage. Hit the I got a good deal on almost a new, new, new bike, you want it. And it's a girl's bike and I almost fell off of it. Quit laughing, Eddie. It hurt my feelings. All right, but that's the facts. But anyway, see, we have to change our definition. See, we will overflow with discontentment when we think that we should have so much of this and so much of that that God has already given to us. We want more. So if we, if we have food and we have covering for our bodies, we are or should be content with that. And, and I hope we feel how challenging that, that is for us to come to the place in our life where food and raiment is enough. You know, I've told you this before. Uh, a long time ago, I asked the guy, I said, how was your Christmas? He said, it was great. We had a big meal and had family. Mm -hmm. I thought, boy, that was a sad Christmas. He's talking about nothing he got. And you know what? I've come to the place now. I understand that. Mm -hmm. That's what's important. Those are the things that count. Amen. Now, so he wants us to have a completely different uh, think different about it. And uh, and so if I if we have food and we have covering for our bodies, is that not enough? Would that be good enough for us today? Clothes, food, clothes, and a shelter? We would think that we ought to have more, especially when we see that everybody else has more. See, that's what happens. I see Brother Jones have something, and I say, you know, I'd like to have that. Why can't I have that? He's got it. You know what Brother Jones would say? I work for it, and I save for it. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't care. I just want it. <coughs> okay, how you got it? And, you know, that's the thing. That's our thinking. And uh, we need to think rightly about these things. And I hope that we can see verse 7 and 8 work together. And, and do not <clears throat> look at the what everyone else has. See, that's the important thing. That's what happens to us. They got those dishes, so I need those dishes. I saw this on television advertising, and I want that. Well, that's okay to want it. If you can afford it, get it. But just don't think that's what God owes you. Yeah. Don't think that way. So everything we have is from God, and we are not Taking it with us. Understand that. Everything that is more than food and clothing is a bonus. Amen. It's a bonus. Discontentment therewith is not a wealth issue, but rather a heart issue. See, discontentment looks at life incorrectly. <clears throat> I mean, if, if we are not presently satisfied with what we have, we will not be satisfied with what we want. It won't happen. See, nothing is going to feel that desire because discontentment is a heart issue. Having more is not going to fix my problems. And it's not going to fix your problems. You have a heart issue. I have a heart issue if I keep wanting, 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 wanting. Ecclesiastes, the teacher said, in chapter 5, verse 10, he said, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. That's basically what I was just saying. See, you will not be happy with having more. You will be happy when you enjoy what you have. And then God will give you something else. If he so desires. Great wealth is being happy with what you have and walking with the Lord in godliness. See, the problem is not finding contentment. It's not finding contentment. Now, here is where Paul is going to warn us about not choosing to be content in verses 9 and 10. And, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, yeah. And uh, the desire is to be rich is very dangerous. You need to understand that. 
And how many of us have not had a friend that had a lot and we sat around and said, boy, I, I could do this or I could do that. I've heard people say, man, if I could, if I could win the lottery, I would tie. Okay, win the lottery. But I'll never win the lottery because I'm not going to play the lottery. But you think about that, that we always are wanting something else. See, the desire for more will bring disaster to your life. Listen to what Paul said in verse 9. He said, but they that will be rich fall in the temptation and a snare and into many foolish <clears throat> and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now, that sounds pretty bad. See, this desire for more will lead you into all kinds of temptations in the traps and all other kind of senseless harmful desires that we can come up with <clears throat> and we do come up with see that plunges people into destruction and truth and uh, see notice that Paul does not say that this is possible but that it is a spiritual truth for life not to want what everybody else has See, this is what happens when we are discontent and desire to increase what we have. See, you'll be, you will experience temptations and traps and harmful desires until you are plunged into destruction and ruin. And when you're plunged into destruction and ruin, you need to think about the prodigal son. Remember what? I want my part. He did not deserve it. He shouldn't have gotten it. His daddy probably knows he made a mistake by giving it, but it did teach him a lesson. But he came to himself when he was in the hog pen. He didn't have shelter, and he really didn't have food. Now, he did eat what they found, what they had in what they fed the pigs. But he didn't have any of that, and he sure did not have contentment. But he was away from home. Now, should we not run far away from discontentment when we hear the absolute danger and the disaster that will happen? Sure. See, godliness with contentment is critical because disaster is prepared for those who keep wanting more. If you get out there and you just keep, I've got to have, I've got to have, and before you know it, you're in debt way above yourself. You can't even, listen, they give credit cards away like aspirin. And you know what? You'll be at the place one day if you keep doing that, that you won't even be able to get a credit card. Because you'll have the four or five you have up to snuff. All the way up top. So why does that happen? Well, Paul explains that. Look at verse 10. We'll try to explain verse 10. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, loving money is a root for all kinds of things to happen to you. Notice that Paul does not say that money is the root of all evil. He doesn't say that. That's not what he's talking about here. What he said is way broader and far more condemning. The desire for money is the root for all evil. Having money is not a problem. And I like that. I mean, we, we like that. And uh, wanting more money is the problem. Always saying, I could do this and I could do that. And then you find yourself doing things you shouldn't be doing to get it. And there's your problem. Wanting more is the problem. See, discontentment is the ground for all kinds of future problems and future sins when you're discontent. See, Paul then wants to prove this to us by showing us that this has happened to so many other people. Look at the rest of verse 10. First of all, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many arrows. Okay. 
It has happened to others, and let me just sadly tell you, it can happen to us. Very important. It can happen to us. Reaching for more only causes more pain. Reaching for more never gives you what you are looking for. Because see, <clears throat> what we really are looking for is satisfaction and contentment. So, now, so how does this apply to you and me? Well, we're talking about important characteristics as the people of God who are to overflow with the streams of living water, living, living water, as we talked about in John when we started this series. Contentment is a characteristic that is easy to overlook because we don't think about it very often because we're always out there trying to get it. See, the point Paul makes here, he wants us to see here, is that great gain is not by having wealth or possessions. That's what he's telling us. Great gain comes from what? We read it, godliness. Doesn't come from money. Doesn't come from statute. Doesn't come from any of that. Great gain comes from godliness. Desiring God is when you will experience the wealth of life that God offers. But we can easily miss this as we ask at possessions and look for possessions and become discontent. We allow our hearts to want more and more and more and more. Rather than realizing joy and satisfaction comes by wanting more and more and more of Jesus. Amen. See, we must train our hearts to stop looking for joy outside of Jesus. See, godliness comes from, uh, great gain comes from godliness. More of Jesus. We must train our hearts to stop looking for that more and more. The next time we think that a, uh, another possession or another person is the answer to our contentment, we must have the warning flag raised in our minds and in our hearts that this is not true. They will not make me happy. That will not make me happy. Because as soon as you get that or them, that's what? You just search them again. Bigger, better, and newer never delivers what we think it will deliver. Paul wants us to think about the result of our discontent. Remember that it was Paul who told us temptations and traps and snares, harmful desires along with ruin and destruction come from discontent. <coughs> See, loving money leads us to all kinds of problems. Now, is money bad? No. But loving it to the point you'll do anything to get it is. Amen. And we have all pursued that line in our life. Pretty much. We've always wanted more than what God wanted us to have. I'll be the first to say it. I have. I've done. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a lot to you. Just take a moment and consider how many temptations you have experienced in your life simply because you were not satisfied with what you had. Anything come up? Sure it did. You see the picture? If you really thought about it. How many traps and snares have we experienced because we were not content? How many times have we been led into other harmful desires because we are not happy with what we have? How many times has our lives been dragged through ruin and wreckage because we keep wanting more and more and more and more? And we can't ever get it because it, we keep wanting more. How many griefs have we experienced because we... Have a love for more. See, we need to bring our eyes inward and look at all that God has given us. See, take a piece of paper and write it out. 
Start naming the blessings one by one, what God has done for you. And you'll be surprised how much he's given you. Above covering and also food. Place to stay. Most of us live in a better place that we could actually provide for ourselves. God has provided for us better than what we deserve. In reality. With this in mind, I don't, you know, none of it, as I said earlier, none of it is ours. It's given to us by God. We can't keep it when we die. You're not going to clutch anything. Because when you die, your hands are going to open and it's going to fall out. Somebody is going to take you, put you in a bag and take you to the mortuary and they're going to strip you of everything you have on them. They're going to take everything inside of you that's liquid that they're going to put in and put something else in there. They're going to make you look pretty as they can. They're going to have a lot of work to do <laughs> on me. But anyway, they're going to do the best job they can. They're going to lay you out with just what somebody said they wanted you to wear. You had no say in it. Usually people say, oh, I've got all this laid out. Let me tell you something. When you die, you lose the authority to say anything. Because you may want that pink dress and somebody else might want the blue dress and you wearing the blue dress and the coffin. You know why? Because you had no say. Once you die, you, it's it. And so, we can't keep it when we die. So, so what is the point to desire more and more and more? It only hurts us. But finally, if we are to ask you if you are rich, I would imagine all of us, everybody here, would raise their hand and say two other words. No. We think we are rich, but we really are not because there's somebody else got way more than you got. That would make them richer, so you would not be rich at all compared to them. And you have to look at it that way. But I think most of us would say that. We usually define being rich as those who have far more than what we have, and that's pretty true. See, but we need to change our definition because, see, we are rich when we have a deep relationship with God. That's what's called godliness. When you have a relationship with God Almighty through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And with food and clothing, we are content. Pursue stuff will not make you happy and it will not give you the gain that you're looking for. So understand this today. Pursuing God will make you happy and give you the gain that you're looking for. Not stuff, but God. There's a difference between stuff and God. Did you not know? But yet we still pursue stuff. I see stuff all the time on TV. I said, man, what the hell is that? And I'm saying, and what would I do with it? I'd put it out there in the garage with the other stuff I wanted. <laughs> that I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of and, 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 and get something back for what I put in it. But that ain't happening either. When I was sick, and she probably can hear me, when I was really sick and couldn't get out, couldn't move, couldn't go anywhere, I want you to know she went to the garage and she carried stuff out. And I have no idea what she carried out. She carried stuff. She put it in the car. Uh, somebody else's car, and they took it to Goodwill. I'm thinking, I hope it wasn't nothing I wanted. <laughs> but I can't see anything that she, I can see what she's done, but I can't see what she did, you know, what she took out. And I got to thinking, I said, there, I'm, I've lost control of Nancy. I'm still living. <laughs> and she told me, if you've been sick another week, I'd have had the garage clean. <laughs> And I, I, I got, there's path now. You've seen houses with a hoarder's path? I got that in the garage. I can get around there. It's awesome. But anyway, 
You didn't want to hear that. But so, as I said, pursuing stuff will not make us happy. It'll, it will not give you the gain that you're looking for. See, pursuing God will make you happy and give you the gain that we need. The gain that we really were looking for. So, do we overflow with contentment? In reality, most of us don't. There's a few, but most of us don't do that. You know why? Because we like stuff. We like what we don't have. We look at it and say, check, I'm going to get that. We put it in that list that I call the bucket list, and we say, I'm going to get that one day. Well, now I'm getting so old, I don't even care. I about empty my bucket list and ain't done nothing of it. <laughs> and that's where I'm at. So do we overflow? Are we satisfied with all that God has allowed us to have and use while we spend our days on earth? And see, that's what God has done. He has given us what we need for us to enjoy the life that he has given us with yeah. his stuff. It's his stuff. Because you're not going to own it when you die. It's going to go to somebody. He's going to give it to somebody else. Somebody else will get it. So, as I close, why not ask the Holy Spirit this morning to speak wisdom into your heart? Why don't you ask the Holy Spirit right now how you can apply this message and this message to you and your life? Not to the person sitting beside you, but to you as an individual today. Let's ask him right now. Father, as we come, we are grateful.